Hi everyone. So, um, my unusual response to this unusual situation will be to film what we would have normally done in class, which is the responses that everyone had to the film being the change, the uh, readings for being the change. Um, and what you're looking at is, of course, the course website. You can see this is the actual page there. And what I'm going to do is just scroll down the way I normally do, with the one exception. Um, I will scroll sort of ahead so you can read the material and then back rather quickly. Normally I leave it up on the screen for a half a minute or so so everyone in the room can read it all. But at this point, um, you know, you can just scroll back and forth or hit the pause button as necessary. So here's the first comment. By the way, um, this comment was probably one of the most popular this term in the sense of the number of replies that it had. I think we had one a couple of weeks back with 70 odd responses. This one had 68 and for good reason as you read it here. So let me go back here. Yeah, an incredibly powerful comment and uh, my heart goes out to this person. Um, and it, it just underscores in a, in a very personal way something we've been talking about all along in this class, that, you know, people across the planet do not have the sort of privilege that we have in this country. You know, we saw Bangladesh in the film The True Cost, and I gave you some, you know, startling stats regarding that. And in a way, it's still a little academic, but this is not across the world in Bangladesh. This is, you know, a few hundred miles away in Mexico, and, you know, that should be you know, close for all, all of us, but especially, you know, we're a Hispanic-serving institution at UCSB. We have a, you know, a large number of people who have direct connection to this part of the world. And even there, you know, it shows incredible difference in privilege. And, of course, in a non-environmental way, this underscores a, you know, <sighs> the kind of horrible state that we are right now where people are being deported. But, okay, let's talk about the, the issue at hand. Um, Peter Kalmus, the use of a, uh, not a clothes dryer, but actually using a clothes line. A number of people commented on that. And just to, as a little aside, uh, one of the things, if you're interested in cutting your energy use, one thing to do is actually to think about using a clothes line. So of all the energy that we use in our homes for appliances, uh, washer and dryer takes about 10% of that. But here's the good news. You can actually cut that down right now to one-tenth of what it was, from 10% down to 1%. How do you do it? Uh, simple enough. When you wash your clothes, don't use hot water. Use instead cold water, which can usually get clothes just about as clean. And then instead of using a dryer, just use a clothesline. And remarkably, that will reduce 90%, those two things together, your energy consumption. Um, but, you know, people are living, you know, in the world without having those choices. We can make them. But, you know, in almost kind of solidarity with the rest of the world, we should think about making them, um, even aside from environmental reasons. But the big takeaway from this class thus far is to recognize our privilege here as students at UCSB. And I would, I would underscore that. And this is students, faculty, everyone. Even if we don't feel like the 1%, we are. Globally, we wreak environmental havoc and let the global south suffer because of our greed. Yeah, how can I not agree with that? I, I think it's true. So um, learning about all this is itself a privilege. And I'm not saying just because you're in my class, what a privilege. I'm not saying that. Just being able to be at a university like UCSB is a privilege that we, we you really have to think about. But we really think about how, um, and I think you know, this person puts it there, how do you use our privilege for good? You know, we cannot be complicit in the most catastrophic environmental crisis of our time. I, I think I should put this up on a website somewhere, this comment. It is so good, and it is something to think about. You know, how will you use your privilege? In other words, will you use it to become, you know, super successful and have a Cardassian-like lifestyle and a, you know, a little stable of cars and fly around the world first class and all? Maybe you will. Maybe that's what, you know, you've always thought about. I think 
you know, we're encouraged to think about that. But this person, I think, recalls us to the fact that it is, one, privilege, and two, that it's privilege that we can use for good. And if you don't think it's privilege, just think about, you know, even a few hundred miles from here, people like this person's parents do not have anything like the privilege that we have. Yeah, and I can't imagine what that's been like uh, for this person, by the way. And again, what a wonderful thing that we have a class with such enormous diversity. Um, but, you know, again, my heart goes out to this person being estranged from your parents because they were deported from their country it is a problem. Yeah, we do have a choice, and we have to remember that, that we have a choice. Let's see what I can get here. We are single-handedly abusing every, almost every resource, commodity, luxury, except and without batting an eye to the damage it's doing. And one thing we'll talk about by way of Peter Kalmus is his notion of mindfulness and meditation. And in part, I think it, it really comes down to this, that, you know, by the way, if you hear noise in the background, I'm re recording this in my backyard office, which is like a, 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 a tiny house, but it's much smaller. It's just an office. And um, I have backyard chickens, and one of them has um, decided to become kind of loud now. I'll see if I can turn the speaker over to her. I'm not sure what her problem is, but just letting you know. Anyhow, um, we're not batting an eye at the damage we're doing. And I think what Peter Kalmus would say, we have to open up our eyes to that. We have to think about the problems that, you know, are in the world. And, and let's be blunt, the problems that we are causing in the world. We, we can't, can't not bat an eye to it. We need to open our eyes to it. And we have the option, and I think that's right. We have the option to change, and I think that that's that's a great that's a great statement right there. Change what? Yes, the planet, the climate crisis, and all. But you know, immediately we have the option to change our lifestyle into something much more sustainable and eco-friendly. Yeah, we are using our privilege to feed our greed for material things. Um, and again, goes back to that, and what incredible privilege we have, and yet what are we using it for, which is to feed our greed for material thing. Um, Kalmus's book gave some hope because he really made it sound almost easy to switch to a more environmentally friendly lifestyle. And I don't know if it's easy. I think this person is right, almost easy, um, but doable. Not not a Herculean task to do it. I think that's right. And um, I thought that was one of the great things about the book, uh, and we'll talk a minute about the difference between the book and the documentary, but both of them uh, made clear that, that he and his family, his family life at all, you know, became happier because of it. So yes, it's doable, um, and it, it can make a huge difference in life. Yeah, I'll just go down so you can see the whole quote and then I'll pop back up again. Yeah, um, and again, in such a large class, the, the person who made the original comment is not the only person now in the, the unfortunate um, era that we've been in for the last few years who has felt the, the pain of having a family member deported. Yeah. is not admirable, but for most people in the world, there is no, it's, it's not only, hold on, the conscious choice to switch to, for a carbon infused lifestyle to a smaller one, um, is admirable, but for most people in the world, there is no choice to make. And I, I think that's right. I mean, I think it's absolutely right. Yeah, and, and as I've said, this person now invoking minimalism, um, it is a, quote, first world solution to a first world problem. And it is our privilege that we, uh, that we have to think about here. Um, and there, there's not a lot of things available to the others, in part because, you know, we're sort of hoarding them here in the United States. Yeah. 
This is a good pr uh, statement, but sometimes choice is forced by the hands of others, and I feel like the, and this choice to be more environmentally conscious needs to be encouraged by our government. I think that's right. I mean, when you realize that the government, our government, the U.S. government, is subsidizing the fossil fuel industry, making gasoline and all cheaper, it's subsidizing the beef industry, making beef in uh, cheaper, and and it's significant. And, and you know, the the thing about it is, and and this is where the decision is being made by someone else. Okay, you can live a largely plant-based diet. Maybe you can be completely plant-based and be vegan. Okay, fine, but here's the problem. If you're in the United States and you pay taxes, you are subsidizing hamburgers and McDonald's. The McDonald's hamburger, McDonald's so-called Happy Meal, we should talk about that at some point. But anyhow, that hamburger and McDonald's, you're partly paying for that hamburger by subsidizing the beef industry. So even though you may go to extreme lengths, and I can tell you, having been a vegan for five years, you kind of go to extreme lengths sometimes. Um, in a way, it's not all being nullified, but it's, it's, it's being you know, chipped away at by a government who in, um, encourages you know, um, beef and um you know, other uh, animal-based products. Yeah. This is another good point. We have such immense privilege the countries view us as a dream place to live. People die trying to get here. And that, that's not a figurative statement. That's a literal statement. And it's happening right now, you know, at... at all over, but at our southern border, of course. And even when people get here, they're met with racism, unjust treatment, and as the original comment noted, you know, they actually have to fear deportation, which actually is happening. And yet, this because this country is so idolized and put on a pedestal for greatness, but really, this country is has immense greed. That's something to think about. In other words, the thing that everyone is coming here is this lifestyle that we've shown them, the incredible greed that we are displaying. Um, we really think of have to, about sending that message out to the world. Um, we really need to think about making, again, we've said it again and again, but the American lifestyle, what we, we share with the world, spread to the world, encourage the world to do, we, we need to make that not based on something like, as this person notes, immense greed, but, you know, wouldn't it be something if people were trying to get into the country because, um, or just happy to be here because we were a happier country, that we were, you know, one of these countries like Denmark and all, they were just filled with such happy people, you know, riding around on their bicycles. Uh, it would be great if, if we could make America desirable for that reason. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm assuming you've read the whole thing, and I'll just jump in. Uh, some people did find, you know, the meditation scene is a little kitschy, uh, tattoo, cringeworthy. Um, but the readings, for some people, were much easier to understand and accept. And again, that's why the course was kind of set up this way, right? We had readings and we had films. Different people will like different you know, readings, different films. Some people like films more than readings. This person likes readings more. Um, hopefully it gave you a broad wet range of ways of taking this material in. Um, this thing, a person, you know, uh, one thing that really resonated with this person is how personal action can begin to shift culture by other people witnessing the change. And I do think this is important because I, for one, know that I'm often disheartened by our current situation. So, uh, this statement and others here and, um, has made me think about the, how I'll teach this class again, and I hope to do it again. And first off, let me kind of an aside. I, you know, I learned so much uh, teaching this and how to structure it, and um, I'll be doing things differently, hopefully improving it. Um, so, for example, you know, having our classes taken up with just this, I'm going to show more videos actually during the lecture, break it up, and I have other ideas. And if you have ideas, you know, do send them to me. But one thing is um, I want to do a, a part of a lecture or rather a lecture next year um, called something like We Are All Influencers. You know, we have a preoccupation, some would say an obsession, 
with influencers, people like, I don't know, Kim Kardashian or whatever. Um, and, you know, we kind of forget that we're all influencers. We influence people all day long. We may not think of it, but we do. You may not realize that someone the next table over from you in the cafeteria is being influenced by the fact that they happen to notice that you're eating a plant-based diet or whatever. Um, we can do that all day long. And I think, you know, we, we can't forget that you're doing it anyhow, right? So if you're the person that, you know, always, you know, stacks up meat on their, their plate, you're doing, you're influencing too. We do it in all sorts of different ways. And it's good because people do feel disheartened. And yet, if you realize, and I thought that's why we, we kind of focused a good bit on Peter Kalmus, both with a reading and a film, is because there are people who can actually and are actually doing this. Um, yeah, most people aren't going to do human composting, um, but maybe other ideas that are convenient or cost-effective would be people would begin to adopt. So a couple things. Uh, first, human composting, you may know from Peter Kalmus, part of the problem is, and it's one of these things probably you never think about, is that your own waste, of course, um, is a source of greenhouse gas emissions, but that can be greatly mitigated by composting. Um, Peter Kalmus' approach, like so much of what he does, is simple, grassroots, you don't need a lot of money to do it. But it's also noteworthy that there are things like composting toilets that you can actually have in your house that look pretty much like a regular toilet but actually do composting right there so that it doesn't go out into the sewer and create a problem. We, we really need to think more about things like this. And I know if you're thinking like climate change, it's the last thing in the world you're thinking about. But as Kalmus rightly notes, run the numbers and these are not in, insignificant problems. Another one I thought was great, we don't think about natural gas leaking or specifically, Peter Kalmus talks about when he moved to a relatively small house, you know, because he had a, um, a range, a furnace, uh, a gas, um, hot water heater, and things like that, each of them, five things in total, he notes, had a pilot light. If you look at the amount of gas that was actually, you know, burned just to keep those pilot lights going, it was, you know, 1,600 um, or, or 1 1.6 metric tons, uh, 1,600 uh, kilograms, 1 1.6 metric tons, an enormous amount, almost what should be a person's climate footprint for the year. And there's no need for that, right? So appliances now can be fitted with like little piezoelectric starters. And um, that means that there's no gas running until you turn the valve on and then a little spark is ignited that lights it and no pilot light required. So another statement here, just great. Um, that re 30, 50 replies were given to that statement, and this one I thought really summed up a, a wonderful point. Environmentalism is a state of mind. Um, Peter Kalmus discusses with us things that we can do to reduce carbon emissions through personal, uh, through his personal relative results of um, his actions. So Peter Kalmus is very clear about that. You know what he's doing is going to be different for um, than other people, but it's all about. And this is kind of the mindfulness thing again. It's all about being aware, aware of what you're doing. We're just unaware of it. People are unaware that, you know, their waste is, is causing emission problems, unaware that they even have pilot lights, let alone what they're uh, you know, doing to the planet. So we have to be aware. And I think, you know, the, this person here had a wonderful quote. I think this should be made into a bumper sticker. Um, Daily life is a series of choices. Um, which is, of course, Kalmus's quote. Um, I think this is right, and I think it goes to environmentalism being a state of mind. We may not think of daily life as a series of choices, but it is. Why we may not think it is, because so often we go through life and we don't think about the choices. You know, we go to have something to eat and we choose things that are, you know, um, not plant-based. We decide to, you know, um, go somewhere and we, you know, we call an Uber or Lyft rather than hopping on a bicycle. We're, we're not always thinking about these things because we've always done them a certain way. Because you're, why is that? Because your parents have always done them that way, your friends always do them that way, or whatever. So I think to, you know, the, um, the first step is to try to be aware of all this. And I think that's a great thing. By the way, I just put that one twice, so let me scoot down here. Uh, this is another reply. 
Yep. Um, one thing to note, and I think Calmus is clear on this, you know, um, is that if you make these changes, they can have real world impact, not only um, directly. So, you know, um, companies like Burger King and, um, you know, you can name any other, you can name a whole range of other um, companies of different sorts, they're making changes, they will make changes based on what we ask of them. And they will make changes based on the way we kind of vote with our dollar. So if we move away from, you know, eating, eating beef and all of a sudden, Suddenly, a company like Burger King is going to, you know, be on have hard times. Maybe go out of business unless they can adapt. So we can pressure them to adapt, and we can pressure whole industries like the coal industry to adapt. Yeah. Um, but this person knows. However, this process alone will be way too slow for how bad the situation with our planet is at the moment. I think that is absolutely right. So what do you do? So. We need to vote for better policies as well as to, uh, people to enact those policies. I think that's right. So I just mentioned like the coal industry and all. Well, you know, how, how exactly do you personally try to stop the coal industry? Well, you can do it through activism. And we saw um, with the activists we met in our class, you know, people can make huge billions of dollars of impact um, through activism. But you also have to vote for, um, for better um, policies and people who put the policies in place, that we will stop subsidizing coal, that we will begin phasing coal out very, very, very quickly and come up with you know other um, alternatives that we can, in fact, subsidize, and those would be things like renewables, of course. Yep. Um, this person also notes like the human composting has a certain stigma about it, you know, um, and goes on with the example of freeganism, you know, um, freeganism, a lot of people synonymous with like dumpster diving. Um, but, you know, this person notes rightly that, you know, a store or a supermarket like Albertsons or any others have, you know, food that is now on its way out as waste and they discount it heavily. So, you know, that in a way is is getting food that is not being thrown away. Um, and then, you know, uh, and, you know, uh, and they're just as good as others with maybe some stale or dry pieces. Maybe that's right. Maybe it is a little old and it's not quite as fresh. But on the other hand, think of what you're doing kind of for the planet in this, in this way. Uh, maybe all stores should have corners like this and, of course, then donate to, like, um, homeless shelters or food banks or something. Yeah, but here's another to the point regarding us. Stores won't know if, uh, if we want things like this unless we tell them and make efforts to use them when they're available. And again, that's the this notion again. You know, you can kind of vote with your um, with your dollars. And we're going to talk about a, another kind of voting with a, another comment. I thought a great point. Um, Peter Kalmus starts, and I thought this was a very great observation. Um, by addressing and um, everything that he was doing wrong. Um, even before that, by acknowledging everything that he was doing wrong. And that's a hard thing to do, right? I mean, this is like, like the first step in some sort of, you know, way into a new way of life. You first have to see and acknowledge and then address what's wrong. And most people won't admit all the things that they're doing badly. We, we don't want to think about it, right? And, 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 you know, for better or worse, this class kind of held a mirror up to you to make you think about it, uh, hopefully for better. Um, and that's something that, you know, just the very fact that you've done that or, or doing that is, is, is a huge thing. And I think, I think this person underscores it's right. Yeah, and um, looking at Peter Kalmus is great because, as this person says, you know, um, let's be honest, most of us are doing the same. Most of us are, are, are doing the same kind of things that he was doing. And this person rightly notes, and I agree, I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, and again, most Americans, the numbers he gave were so astonishing that most Americans are just not aware of what they're emitting or how much and all. And if you told people something like, you know, you're emitting a, a metric ton and a half of CO2 emissions because of the pilot lights in your house, a lot of people don't even know what a pilot light is. So I think, you know, it's really good to, um, 
to, to focus on that, to become aware of it and acknowledge it. Um, the other chapter, Collective Activism, um, so Nicholas Stern was um, not too long ago chief economist for the World Bank, and he noted, and Kalmus, of course, quotes him on it, that climate change is the result of the greatest market failure the world has ever seen. And I, I think that's right. And by market failure, I mean this is an economic problem, an economic system of sort of rampant, unchecked free market capitalism, and that has created um, a huge problem. It is, is a failure of markets. In other words, if the markets would have been controlled and moderated, it would not have brought this about. Yeah, um, so, and he talks about ways of fixing it. Um, I'll let you read this and then you can pause and then you can come back to me because what I would like to underscore are a couple things here. Um, Kalmus decided to change his lifestyle for the sake of his children. He wanted a better world for them. Um, I, th I think that's a, good, that's a good way of thinking about it. People won't always do things for themselves, but if you're thinking about your child, that's different. I once read a study from years ago, I'm not sure if it's true anymore or not, but they asked people um, if they liked their job. Two out of three people said no. They didn't, uh, said yes, they liked their jobs. Um, they then asked, would you want your child to have your job? Two out of three people said no. So while you may be willing to do certain things and for yourself, would you want them for your child? A lot of people would say no. To put it simply in another way, people want a, a better life for their children. Now, traditionally, kind of with the American dream, that better life has always um, sort of been equated with more, you know, financial success and having more um, than, you know, your parents had. And um, I think a new thing has to happen now. You, you want a better world for them, or at least a world not a hell of a lot worse because of the climate crisis. So if you want a better, if, you, if, if you're thinking about the future and you're thinking about children, then you really need to be thinking about climate change in 2020. And um, Peter Kalmus, and I think it's also a great more general point, you know, instead of thinking about yourself, and you know, if you're thinking maybe you'll have children, think about them. Instead of thinking about yourself, well, let's think about not the 4% of Americans, which are among, but the 96% of the rest of the planet and what they're experiencing and will experience because of this. And hey, let's not forget, we think not only of human beings, but other beings across the planet, animals who are being impacted by this. Um, another great comment, because he, uh, this person focuses on um, Kalmus has a philosophy which involves the head the hands and the heart. The head is for realizing, uh, this by the way, I, I, I'll just read this because this person I think nailed it on comment. The head is for realizing from an intellectual scientific point of view that there is a problem. And again, that's the first part, acknowledging that there's a problem. And you can kind of only do that intellectually by standing back and looking at it. Once the problem is recognized, we can take action with our hands. We can actually do things. How? Well, the hands are used for gardening, fixing old objects, riding a bike, and much more. And if you think about it, there are plenty of things that you can you know, kind of roll up your sleeves and actually do. Um, and finally, the heart ties the head and the hands together. The heart is where meaning is found in making life more satisfying. So, you know, you had been kind of going on autopilot, not realizing that life is a series of choices. Now you realize the problem. You don't know, you realize not only does life involve choices all day long, but all day long you can, with your hands, bring this about, um, changes, doing new things. And ultimately, um, the conclusion that Kalmuch makes is taking part in environmentally friendly things equals a happier, more meaningful life. And, and that is sort of the, one of the big takeaways from the Kalmus documentary, as well as the one on tomorrow, Damien, that, you know, you would think that this will mean changing our lifestyle, not being, you know, uh, having all the things that we, that we might want or even that, our, uh, that a previous generation had, and yet instead we can have a more meaningful and happier life. And, and we'll see this with the film that I'll be um, doing a little uh, – thing for a little recording like this for which will be the film happy of course yeah
I, I love this quote, and I, I had never heard it before. There was an old saying in China, in order to untie the bell, the person who tied it is required. Human beings are destroying the earth, and human beings need to be the ones that save it. I would argue, however, that not all human beings are saving or destroying the earth, but principally all that damage is being done by a certain segment of human beings, those in the developed world, and those people need to be the ones that step up and undo it. You know, we, 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 tied, we tied up the world in this problem, now we have to, to untie it. Yeah, and again, um, this person made a, a very great comment, I thought. Kalmus' book was, for me, uh, way more informative than this documentary. And this person speculated on a reason for that, and that is it may have been done on purpose because documentaries appeal to a wider range of audience. While books are only good for the ones who, that's people who truly care about the situation and want to make a change. I, I, I think that's probably right. I think, you know, the challenge of making a documentary is that you want it to appeal to a broad range of people who may not want to sit down and spend hours of their lives reading a book that um, may not be a lot of, uh, of fun, you know. So um, the message, the approach has to be a little different. And I think for a lot of people in the class who, who said they liked the book more, I, I think, you know, it's, it says good things about you. Uh, not that it says bad things if you like the documentary or because I, I did like it too. But it means that you're ready to kind of really dive in here and you really, you know, um, there, you really truly care about the situation and want to make a change. You know, if you're, that, if you're in that group, you may find this book particularly interesting because it's all about making a change. Yeah. Um, and, you know, this person rightly notes that this is, and I suggest it like the other half of Project Drawdown, so you can't do things like convert nuclear energy. You can't do things, someone noted uh, when we had the Project Drawdown reading, um, that, you know, this person can't change their rice cultivation habits. You know, that's something we have to do in a big sort of global way. But, you know, you can do things like waste less energy, bike, have more climate-friendly diet, and so forth. Um, and again, I would go to this, you know, it's a huge inspiration for those who will run approach this method, um, and each step they do will know exactly how much they're helping the planet. I do think it is um, inspiration for people. I think Peter Kalmus himself and his family are inspiration for people. But again, I think, you know, we can all be influencers, that we can all, you know, be inspiration for other people. You may not think about it and, you know... Um, you, you, it may not always work that way, uh, <laughs> and I noted that when I had an electric bicycle when I was in high school, I, I don't know that I was an inspiration for very many people at the time who thought I was kind of an oddball. But um, this is nineteen. This is not nineteen seventy six. This is two thousand and twenty, and I think things like bicycling and having an electric bike and using a clothesline. Sure, there's some people that you're not going to inspire. Sure, some people are going to kind of you know poo poo it, even laugh at it. But I, I don't think that's the point. I think there are plenty of people who would be influenced by it. And I think, you know, we really need to take seriously the fact that we are going to be influencers. Um, yeah, so let me just move to other comments here. Yeah, watch the film before the... I hate to admit it, pretty bored by the film. Okay, some people were. But um, this person, and again, different people like different materials in different ways. You know, during the readings, I didn't want to stop. Uh, plan on reading the rest of the material. Um, so on that note, um, Peter Kamas had slowly been uploading all the chapters um, to the book to his personal website, and they are all there now. So um, it'll it'll cost you if you want to read this book. It won't cost you any money. It'll cost you a little bit of time, but you can read the whole book, and and you know you could just read the chapters that you find interesting. And um, if you want to watch the film again, do watch it. Although I should note that um, as we're ending nearing the end of the term, Gaucho cast will go away as far as I know. The film will be taken down. So I would watch it now. Although, you know, if you wanted to watch it um, six months from now, just, um, you know, come to the website here and uh, remember the name and all. And I think you'll be able to find it online or rent it from someplace. I think Amazon rents it now. Yeah. There's a really great point here. I really like how he said we can cast a vote simply by changing the way we live and think. Um, I too found this thought powerful. And, we, uh, and this notion is we think that we can only vote every four years. Well, that's wrong because, as you know, 
the thing is, we can vote, you know, every year, and we can vote in all kind of elections. But this person is so on the mark because, you know, that can kind of bring, you know, a little discouragement because, you know, you really want to to vote on this. You really want to be heard on it. You really want to, you know, in a democracy, have your say. Well, um, you can vote through your day-to-day practices. A little while ago, I noted how you can vote, you know, with your, uh, with your expenditures, vote with your pocketbook, your, your wallet. Sure, you can do that. Uh, but you vote every day, you know, um, through the things that you can do. Um, you know, every day lies, and this is great, but seeing our everyday lives as a, a vote makes me realize, seeing our everyday lives as a vote makes me realize that we are much more responsible and have much more to say in how the world is run and sustained. I think that's right. I mean, again and again in this class, I and a whole range of other people in the comments have, you know, emphasized the importance of voting. But it's interesting to think of voting in a broad kind of way, that we vote all the time, not just in elections, but we vote with our wallet, we vote with the things that we do. Yeah. Um, the notion of a carbon tax, let me just go here, I think I read it from back. Um, you know, like smoking, um, carbon tax or carbon pricing in general, I think that's, you know, something just to be very clear. You know, not everyone is going to jump on board and do this um, if there is sort of no incentive. But, you know, people are scared of money or money makes people stand up and notice. So if we do that and, you know, if a gallon of gasoline suddenly jumps to, you know, 7, 8, 10, 12, 15, 20 dollars a gallon because of carbon pricing, well, it's going to discourage people from driving. Um, You may already, you know, thinking about the situation already have sworn off of like having a car. That's fine. That's great. Unfortunately, not everyone will. So we have to find out a way to, um, to kind of encourage the rest of the people and carbon pricing is something to do. So Peter Kalmus again uh, talks about five most effective methods. Um, he was very clear right in the book that this is what it was for him. In other words, he was able to run the numbers and look at his, his life. They may not be the same for you, but for a lot of people it is. And, um, you know, I've given you a list of, a um, little list along the way, but then that big list of 20. Um, his five are quitting planes, vegetarianism, or I would say climatarianism, uh, bicycling, I would say just make sure to get rid of a car, um, freedom, uh, and this is freedom not to be sort of buying into everything and consumer culture and all and composting. Um, composting, by the way, is something that, that uh, hopefully you can do in your community. You can either do it directly or many communities um, um, do it. But uh, again, you know, um, it's not a lot here. Uh, you know, and you can drastically, these things, just looking at them here, yeah, for most people, you'll cut your climate footprint in half doing these things. And again, you, you don't have to do it all at once or all completely, right? So let's talk about planes. I know a number of people in class were really, you know, uh, would be impacted by not flying. And if you're, you know, an international student, you live very far from Santa Barbara, planes have to be part of, of your life. Um, well, you know, you can think about a life, imagine your future life where planes would play less of a role. That would be a big deal. Even when you're here, you know, um, um, let's say you're making four trips home a year, well, maybe you could get rid of one of those. Sort of like climatarianism, right? It's like cutting it down a little. Hey, maybe you could get rid of two. And suddenly you, then you would take your you know, climate footprint for flying and cut it in half. I'm not saying you have to do that. I don't know your circumstances. But I'm just saying you could see how these things would have an impact um, even if you don't do them all completely. Um, this is a great statement. And this will segue into the the film they were watching this week, Happy. It is manageable. It is doable. May not be easy, you know, but it's not all that hard either. Um, And ultimately leads not just to a better planet, but potentially a happier person. Yeah. I'm going to let's read this one last comment and then we'll stop here um, and with the replies to it. Oh, this is where I stopped. Sorry. Um, here's a valuable skill Peter has taught me that everyone needs to adopt. We need to keep score. This kind of goes with being mindful, but just not being aware of it, but needs to see yourself as accountable, needs to be able to look at the things you do and keep score of how they are impacting the planet. That is mindful action and holistic change, and that will result in a truly sustainable lifestyle. But 
at a bare minimum, people should be aware of the damage they are inflicting. I think that's a great statement because this is not action at this point, right? So I've talked earlier about, you know, how knowledge is power only when acted upon. Well, at least this is knowledge. It is a kind of personal knowledge. It's a knowledge of your life, of your personal actions. And you need to be aware of the damage it's inflicting. And this is being the thing about being mindful and opening your eyes. Just be aware of it. That That is, at a, as this person notes here, at a bare minimum what you need to do. And I think to not do that, to live, you know, with your head buried in the ground or to be in a state of denial, that's a problem. So if nothing else, if you make no change, just be aware of the impact that you're having and the damage that you're inflicting, because it is damage. Um, you know, the first step is is to know where one might be going wrong. And and a lot of people just don't know where they're going wrong, right? And we could talk about a plant-based diet, which has kind of been a favorite one for this class, but you may not know you've been going wrong with, you know, uh, um, if you had, you know, uh, gas-fired power uh, pilot lights in your house. You may not know that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And as this person notes, physically seeing the change that is being made can be the best motivation in a great way um, to generate collective activism. So, you know, once you face up to these things and see them and that they are, in fact, inflicting damage and, and not just on the planet, but on ultimately you, as in California, we're now suffering the consequence of climate change. And if you're going to have, you know, thinking about children, they will be, you know, uh, the damage will be inflicted on them and it's certainly being inflicted on people all across the planet. Yeah, but then, you know, um, this is a, a great statement because you wouldn't have thought this sentence would end in this word. Here are some things that these readings have made me want to start doing as acts of personal awareness. You thought this sentence was going to end in personal action, but instead, and it's a great perceptive statement. And by the way, if people wonder why I spend these lectures, you know, going over the statements that people make in class, um, it's because I find them immensely valuable. I'm sorry, I, I don't get nearly as many as I would want to get up. But your, you know, the classmates, the people in this class have such remarkable things to say that I am happy to spend the time. And again, I'm going to change that a little next time around. But this time, I have been happy to just stand back and hear what others have to say because, honestly, I've been learning an immense amount from other people, and I, I hope you have too. And, and, you know, another way of putting it, I, I, I do not see myself as the only teacher in the room. And I think that should always be the case with a teacher, even of the little discussion section. But how great it is to have such a diverse group of, uh, of people all, you know, potentially teaching us different things. Yeah, so how do you start? By noticing how much um, less you might be able to spend on new stuff per year. Being aware of how much you're spending and to think about how you may, you know, um, how, you know, making, uh, seeing how small efforts to reuse item and buying overall less. And perhaps bigger travel um, efforts. Carpooling. Um, I am interested in moving somewhere with better transportation for the public. I hate spending money on gas. I'm constantly frustrated by the barrier of the car travel house and reducing my carbon footprint. And so this is a, is, a, is a fascinating way to look at this, right? Um, with both awareness now and things that you can do right now. So right now you can like become aware of how much you're spending on stuff, right? And how much you're not reusing stuff. Fine. But this person is, is slowly transitioning to something else here, and that is the future. And this applies especially if you're, you know, a UCSB or college student. You can really think about making uh, the future life that you're going to have and the impact that that will have. And I think that's something really great to do. So even now, you can begin acting on that awareness with change. But on the other hand, you can begin mapping out a future that, that you know where the change is far more extensive. And I can tell you, there, there are so many cities you can move to where you wouldn't even want a car to go with this example. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I never want to dry my clothes uh, anyways. This reduces their lifespan. Well, hey, you know, that's another fact. You can go online, you'll find people who um, who will talk at length about why you shouldn't wash your jeans as much as we do, and they're right. Um, and they'll also tell you, by the way, that if you care about them, you should wash them in cold water, not hot. And these little things can actually um, have a big environmental consequence, too. 
Um, these are simple changes I see within my reach, other than the more commonly discussed, often broad topics. And and again, that's right. And Peter Kalmus is clear about that. Right, he's focusing on the things that, you know, impacted his life in the biggest way. But you know personal awareness where this person started with this comment um, involves becoming aware and then acting on those things. And they may not be, you know, uh, broad, well-known topics. So I'm going to reread these chapters again, perhaps the entire book. Yeah, I, I, I think I think awareness is a great thing personally to have, have personal awareness. But um, going to the issue we've been talking about, you know, on and off throughout the term, which is really what this course is about, is communication, you know, so that other people can can become aware too. So this was a great comment um, for a number of reasons, um, a couple main ones. So um, first, you know, um, if you think about it, this person is right in underscoring that they were lucky. Um, because, you know, if you are raised by someone who is aware of these kind of problems, you know, imagine what that means for them throughout their whole lives. And, and that is something to think about if you're, you know, you're planning on having children, aware, raising them with awareness, you know, um, you know, we talk about, you know, how parents want better things for their children, and maybe that means, you know, more cars or something. But, you know, I, I can't think of a better thing to, to give to a child, which is greater awareness. And, and one thing we haven't talked a lot about in this class, in English 22, we, we, we did more, and that is, you know, um, you know, more about the environment and the beauty of our Earth and universe in general. They bred in me, it's worth noting here, this sense of thankfulness and wonder. I always felt that we were so lucky to be living where we are amongst all these wonder, all this wonderful beauty and diversity from our um, fellow human to every other animal life and nature itself. And it's, it's, it's a really beautiful sentiment. Um, you know, Rachel Carson, uh, we, in English 22, we read the book um, Silent Spring, but she also has a book called The Sense of Wonder. And it's about the fact that, you know, the world, nature, is, is, is so astonishing and fills one with a sense of wonder. If you wonder about the importance of wilderness and all, uh, you know, and you kind of I've been talking about moving to cities and all that, but nature and, and, and wilderness and even parks in, in cities and all are filled with, with wonderful things and can invoke a sense of wonder. And I would argue, and I guess have argued, that that sense of wonder is almost, uh, uh, can be, uh, one of the real sort of starting points for environmentalism and all. In other words, if you care about the planet, you feel a sense of you know wonder um, toward it, then you know you're going to care about trying to preserve it, and you're going to care about. Well, for the example, you know we're using forty percent of the United States to you know to raise crops for the beef industry to raise cattle directly. Yeah, what if we were able to turn you know big portions of that back into into more or um, wilderness or silver patch, pasture and other things. I mean, th how wonderful that would be. And um, I should note that the Rachel Carson's book, if you ever get a chance to read it, it's very short and actually derived from an article, The Sense of Wonder. Um, she wrote it as she was dying of cancer, and it was about her experience with her little nephew um, and, and sort of showing him, and he was only like a toddler at the time, the beauty of the world, but also seeing how he you know, uh, um, also, you know, had a natural instinct to connect up with nature. And I, uh, I think that's a good place to end here because I think we have to remember, you know, that in addition to saving the planet for ourselves, for our children, for the other people on the planet that we share it with, for animals and all, it, it, you know, for itself, this remarkable deeply enmeshed ecosystem that we have uh, as a planet is, is an astonishing thing and, and um, it's worth saving in its own right. Okay, so so ends this unusual lecture. Um, I will put this up on YouTube directly, and it will um, be up there for at least the end of the class, so you have it to prepare for the uh, final exam. But I'll probably pull this one down because it's not part of the regular lectures, and uh, if people are going to come to our channel, I'd rather they uh, watch some of the regularly prepared program. Okay, well, thanks a lot.